Guys, good Friday afternoon. My name is Jerry Miller, and welcome to the I Love Seville show, live on Instagram, Facebook, and across social media on the I Love Seville network. Folks, Charlottesville Commonwealth in the country watching the program with a lot to cover. We're going to let you know Instagram and Facebook about a food truck that's for sale in this area for $55,000. In fact, if you look anywhere on Craigslist or on any of the for sale websites, you will see like liquidation, liquidation, liquidation when it comes to restaurants in the area, whether it's fridges, whether it's stoves, whether it's, you know, appliances and tools that, that, and, 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 and utensils that are used to run a, a restaurant. You got micro systems for sale. You got food trucks for sale. You got two restaurants that are in operation that you know their name that have asking prices of seventy-five, or excuse me, sixty-five thousand dollars and two hundred and ninety-five thousand. Dirty Nellies has reduced their asking price from seventy-five k. We were the first to let you know this, guys. In this area that Dirty Nellies and Fry Springs is for sale, they've reduced the asking price from seventy-five k to sixty-five k. Uh, the Dogwood at Lake Monticello, they have an astronomical asking price of two hundred and ninety-five thousand dollars for the Dogwood restaurant at Lake Monticello, and now a food truck for sale. So we'll kind of try to vet what's out there and relay the opportunities that are legitimate to you from an F and B space, opportunities galore. We will also talk about this today on the program. Governor Ralph Northrup said, if you're a Virginian and you want a vaccine, you will be able to get it later this year. That's great, Ralph. Let's go ahead and pick up the, the frequency and let's roll out these damn things and let's get the vaccine in people's arms ASAP. We'll talk about that on the program. Charlottesville City Schools are choosing to, to push back the reopening date until March 8th. So students at city schools, they're not going back in person until March now. COVID is raging, rip roaring and raging. We all know that. And, and, and folks, we're going to talk about more turnover at Charlottesville City Hall. This time, Deputy City Manager um, Letitia Shelton has resigned. As a result, Charlottesville City Hall has no Deputy City Managers on its active roster and the interim city manager, John Blair, well, about three or four months ago, he was the city attorney. To say leadership at, at, at Charlottesville City and Charlottesville City Hall is in turmoil is an absolute understatement, okay? Turmoil would be a positive word to use when describing the leadership situation in Charlottesville, Virginia. From what I can tell, these folks that are making north of $130,000, $140,000, $150,000, big money for a town like Charlottesville, they are sprinting, sprinting for the exits, sprinting out of Dodge, getting the hell out of Charlottesville, almost like manifest destiny, pursuing the gold rush on the West Coast. Okay, so we'll talk about that on the program and see if we can determine a common denominator of what is causing this massive attrition and leadership in this town. Thank you again for joining us. My name is Jerry Miller, live across the Commonwealth, the country, and the world on the I Love Seville Network. We're presented by Ting Fiber Internet. We use Ting to power this network. It's the best in the business, and we have an opportunity for you get the, to get the best internet at the best price. You can only get it through this link, Instagram and Facebook. I love Seville.ting.com. I love Seville.ting.com. And you can save $288 on the best internet out there. Folks, let's run headlines. Jude, are you ready to do it? I think I'm ready. How about you? Uh, the first headline, I think, undoubtedly on the show today is got to be the governor saying, anyone who's a Virginian can get a vaccine and it's going to happen later this year. Okay, Ralph is trying to create a sense of confidence among Virginians. Heck, he's a doctor himself. This is my response to Ralph Northrum. This is my response to the people who want the vaccine. Why is this rollout, why is the vaccine getting in people's arms not happening much more quickly? Why are we facing difficulties and bottlenecks and rolling out this, this, this generational vaccine. Why? Why do we not have somebody like the National Guard rolling out the vaccine? 
We literally have vaccinations that are sitting on ice in Virginia. Vaccinations that are in the Commonwealth waiting to get into people's arms. And all we're doing now is, as a government in this Commonwealth is sitting on our hands, biting our nails, and trying to figure out a way to roll it out. That right there, I find frustrating, appalling, nauseating, disturbing, and downright depressing. Let's get them out. If you have to use the National Guard, that's fine. If you don't want to take the vaccine, that's your prerogative. We're in America. You shouldn't be forced to do it. But those of us that want it, the fact that it's on ice and we can't get it, that's some BS right there, dog. Roll it out faster. We need it. All right, let's go micro Instagram and Facebook, and we'll get to your questions. Put your comments in the comment section. I will relay all comments on air today, I promise. You can dictate the pace and tempo of this show by leaving your comments here and across here on the I Love Seville Network. Folks, we've had another resignation with leadership in Charlottesville. This time, it's another deputy city manager. Letitia Shelton. Letitia Shelton resigned in surprising fashion yesterday. Now we have literally no, you heard them correctly, heard me correctly, no city managers, deputy city managers at City Hall. The guy who's leading the city, John Blair, who I love, he was an attorney for the city, a lawyer, a lawyer for the city. A handful of months ago. Now he's the CEO determining the future. We must ask ourselves. Instagram, we've got to ask ourselves. Facebook, we've got to ask ourselves. What is happening here? Why are city managers like Dr. Richardson resigning? Why are all the deputy city managers resigning? Why are the human resources director resigning? Why is the neighborhood services uh, director resigning? Why are people taking a job at City Hall and, 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 and not even arriving in Charlottesville for this job and instead sprinting for, for Powhatan for the same job? Charlottesville's way better than Powhatan. We must start asking ourselves. We must start asking ourselves what is happening. And it seems to me from my vantage point, from my perch here in the Macklin Building on Market Street, from my telescope of a viewpoint of Charlottesville politics and the ins and outs of this municipality that we love so dearly, it seems to me that it trickles back and back and back and back to the mayor. It's not a new perspective that I'm sharing here. I've been consistent with my thought. But you literally have people that are making deep six figures. Deep six figures. Living in a town where a deep six-figure income pretty much will allow you to live in a lot of ways like royalty. And these people who have busted their tails to get to a deep six-figure income job in a high quality of life area like Charlottesville, are saying to hell with this money, to hell with this town. I'm going to resign despite not having a job in place. Boys and girls, the deputy city manager, Letitia Shelton, who resigned yesterday, was one of the top 10 highest paid employees in the city of Charlottesville. City employees. Top 10. Okay? She's not making peanuts here. And she said yesterday, I'm going to freaking stop working here. I don't have another job in play. I'm making a hell of a lot of money in this job, but I can't take it anymore. I have to quit. And quit she did. 
And if we don't start asking ourselves, what is the common denominator? And, and what is the common denominator in watching an esteemed attorney like Lloyd Snook, who's been in this area for how long? Earlier this week, an esteemed attorney, Lloyd Snook, was on Facebook. Lloyd is 15 feet away from me in the Macklin building. He is a good guy. I know him intimately. I would call him a friend. Earlier this week, I saw a guy who is reasonable, level-headed, and has been serving this community for decades as a criminal defense attorney. I saw a guy earlier this week revert back to essentially middle school on Facebook in a back and forth squabble or argument with the mayor. A man who is well north of 60, who's kept people from death row, who earns, who owns a talented, a, a fantastic law firm with his wife, who was a judge, who had to step down from being a judge because Lloyd's on city council. A man who could go into just about any place in the city and someone's going to know him earlier this week was squabbling like a middle schooler with the mayor on Facebook. I mean, I just... What, what am I missing here? People are quitting. Yesterday, someone, a top 10 highest paid employee of the city of Charlottesville, who I assure you is making north of 125K a year, plus benefits. Someone who moved from Texas to Charlottesville with Dr. Richardson. Letitia Shelton, the deputy city manager, said, guys, F this. F this. Enough is enough. I don't care how much money you're paying me. I'm going to quit. And I'm getting out of here. Today, city council is in its second emergency closed door session. The second one in about, in less than 72 hours. Can you imagine being a fly on the wall of a closed door session with five people who clearly don't like each other? On Monday, the mayor called Lloyd Snook a bold-faced liar on social media for the entire town to read. A bold-faced liar. I just, I mean, I'm, I'm flabbergasted. It's a freaking Hollywood movie script. Next headline is city schools pushing back the start date in, until March 8th. Every parent that's watching this show right now that has a student in city schools is like, good gosh, more of this in-person learning. Yesterday we had Lee Elberson. He's the CEO of Claiborne Education, Claiborne Tutoring on the program. Lee is dynamic. You know what he said? He said, we are facing not just a gap in education between the resourced kids. The resourced kids means kids whose family have money. And the under-resourced kids, the kids whose family don't have as much means. The kids whose family have money, they may be le learning in a private school setting. And in a private school setting, they have in-person learning in classrooms. They have sports in person. And their day-to-day -day as a student hasn't really changed outside of a little bit more spacing between their peers and a mask on their face while in their hallways of the private schools. They're still taking SATs and standardized tests like the ACT and AP exams. 
They're still learning with their teachers in person and have the extracurricular activities like sports and key club and honor club, biology and forensics, and all the individual after school extracur extracurriculars you need to get into college. All that's the same for the kids that are resourced, i.e. family has money. The kids and students whose families don't have as much means, they're having to learn through a computer. They're learning their ABCs in the coat closet, geography at the kitchen table, history while sitting on the think tank in the extra bedroom. They're doing their best to survive. But as Lee Elberson, the CEO of Claiborne, characterized what's happening, he said the sixth grader who's going into seventh grade is not really a seventh grader. They're really a 6.5 grader, a six and a half grader. They're not at the seventh grade level. The sixth grader going into seventh grade at the private school level is at that seventh grade level. As a result, his words, an avalanche with the educational gap that's on our horizon. An avalanche separating the resource kid from the unresourced kid. City schools yesterday announced that students will continue learning virtually until March 8th. Geography in the coat room, the ABCs on the think tank and the bathroom tied to the spare bedroom, and a little creative writing at the kitchen table. I hate to use phrases like this, and we don't still know the impact of what's gonna happen. This may be the lost generation of students. If you're applying for college, and you're a resource child, you have an SAT score, you have a couple of AP exams, and maybe you took the ACT to complement your SAT, and then you got your normal subjects on grade because you've learned it in person. A lot of public school kids aren't taking the SAT to get into college. Colleges are saying you don't need the SAT now because of COVID. If you're in the admissions of a college, let's say the University of Virginia where I went, and you're in the admissions department at UVA, and you have thousands of applicants, tens of thousands, tens of thousands of applicants to choose from, and you got Stevie Ray Vaughan that went to St. Anne's Belfield and Tommy Lee Jones that went to Charlottesville High School. And Stevie Ray Vaughan that went to St. Anne's Belfield learned in the classroom, did all his extracurricular activities and took the SAT and here's his score. And Tommy Lee Jones who went to Charlottesville High School learned virtually, not in a classroom, had zero extracurriculars. Stevie Ray Vaughan did all the same. Tommy Lee Jones played no sports. Stevie Ray Vaughan did. And Tommy did not take the SAT. Stevie did. Who the heck is the admissions director going to take to get into UVA? Stevie Ray Vaughan. They got the SAT. They got the extracurriculars and spent the last year learning in the classroom. The message director, all they care about is four-year graduation rates. We won't know the magnitude of this lost generation until potentially a cycle four years from now. A cycle, four years of kids getting out of high school, four years of kids getting out of college. This is serious. A couple things before we get to Aaron Lowry Tucker in our interview with her, which is gonna be about three minutes, four minutes on this program. I'm very excited for that interview with her. I'm seeing opportunity left and right. We talk about what we do at this program, what we do in this building. We run three businesses out of this building. The three businesses we are, we are the number one advertising agency in Charlottesville and Central Virginia. We have the most market share and it's not even close. If you're doing anything from digital, branding, or advertising, or marketing, and you want to win, you do it here with us. The second business we're running is this network we're creating here that is next week when Alex Erpe and his father launch um, their show, which is going to air Thursdays at 10, 15 a.m. next week. It's a show that's specifically focused on the Hispanic community in Charlottesville and Central Virginia and giving them positive attention. 
When I realized that the Hispanic community had no positive attention from a media coverage standpoint, we chose to immediately step in and fill the gap. As a result, next Thursday at 10, 15 a.m., six days from now, we will launch a new program with Alex and his father geared, geared toward the Hispanic community. That's the second business, this network. The third business is the real estate portfolio. We have 27 tenants, and we're trying to grow it. We manage all three out of here. One of the things, there's very few things that I am good at. Very few things that I am good at. Very few. One of them is seeing opportunity. And opportunity is knocking left and right for a number of different industries. Food and beverage. I think opportunity is knocking in an office space. I'll leave that for another show. I'll focus on food and beverage. There's a chance now if you have some courage, some guts, some moxie, some cojones, if you're a risk taker, to potentially create a food and beverage brand. If you start the creation of the brand now, by the time you're ready to come to market, you're looking at summer or maybe fall. At that point, the prediction is the vaccine will be widely distributed and the pent-up demand that has everybody quarantining will really be raging because we all as people want to be around other people. We, we, we as people crave human connection. So the anticipation is summer or the start of third quarter, the economy is going to be gangbusters and really go bananas. Here's the opportunity I'm seeing. The current life cycle of restaurants, the ones that are in operation now, are throwing their hands in the air or saying enough is enough is enough. I'm done with this SHIT. I've burned enough personal resources and personal money and, and, and have cried and have, have considered dark, terrible thoughts through these last 10 months that have been COVID-19. I'm done with restaurants. And if you don't believe me, go to Craigslist and look at for sale in the Charlottesville area. I'm going to show you three opportunities here for you to start a business in, in food and beverage for pennies on the dollar. The first suggestion I would make is if you were going to do a brick and mortar storefront, you, you, you negotiate with every landlord possible because the price of a, uh, of a restaurant now versus the price of a restaurant this time last year is very, very different. And if the landlord is assisting upon class A price points tied to a 2019 Q1 market, you tell the landlord, go F yourself. And I'm a landlord, and I'm telling you what to do. I'm a landlord, and I'm telling you what to do, okay? Any landlord that is trying to justify price points based on Q1 2019 numbers, you tell them to go F yourself. There's many out there that are trying to do that. You take them to the shed and you negotiate with them. If they're not willing to negotiate with them, you say, sorry, I'm not interested. I'll go find one of the many other vacant storefronts. You're not in touch with reality. Look at the downtown grill. How long has the downtown grill been open? How long has it been for sale? How long has it been for rent? Long ass time. So that's the first thing you do. The second thing you do is you consider knocking on the door of current restaurant owners who may be interested in selling their entire lease their entire build out for pennies on the dollar. That's happening right now. I'm hearing about it. I'm helping broker one of the deals as I speak. The third thing I would suggest you do is keep your ears open for opportunity. And here's three. Get the food truck on screen first. Here's a fully loaded food truck for $55,000. 55K, you're like, that's a hell of a lot of money. It's not that much, especially if you're starting a business from scratch. You got something that is turnkey, a turnkey. You're going to have to do the wrap on the food truck so you get your brand on there. I, I, I suggest Ed and Teresa and the team at Front Runner Signs. They do all the work for us. 55K. This is an exceptionally maintained and well-kept food truck. I would go in, I'd lowball, and say I'll give you half. Split the difference, you got a business that you can start for probably less than 35K. Literally, less than 35K. Here's a second opportunity. We were the first to let you know on this network about Dirty Nellies being for sale. Asking price was 75,000 for the Charlottesville Institution Dirty Nellies. 
the owner who's retiring, Gary, he's dropped the ask. The ask is now 65K, not 75,000. Gary, I love you. I enjoy seeing you for cold beers at Dirty Nellie's. You're a great guy. You have a fantastic mustache. Love you, Gary. 75,000 is not the price for this business. Cut it in half. See what happens. Offer 3750. Offer 30. Offer 3250. Offer half. See what the response is. The worst thing they can say is no to you. And if they say no to you, what did you lose? 20 minutes, phone call or in-person conversation? Who cares? Who cares? Who cares if you lose that time? And the final opportunity, Lake Monticello, the dogwood at the lake. It's been on the market forever. $295,000 asking price. Look at the screen. Look at the screen. Look at the screen. $295,000 for the dogwood? Yikes. That, that's not worth that. I don't even think it's worth $100. I don't even think it's worth $100. It's been on the market forever. My point is, Anyone can ask something, ask a price for something. But if the market's not going to pay what they're asking, then it's not worth it. And until we get to summer, and until we get to a vaccine, and until we get to warmer weather, and until we get more consumer confidence, all these opportunities look vulnerable. And because they look vulnerable, that means it's opportunity for you, 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 and you. Take advantage of it. I'm going to close on this before I reach out to our guests, who I'm very excited to uh, welcome, Aaron Lowry Tucker, uh, to the show. My business, my first one, turns 13 years old on May 31st. We launched, I launched this business, I did, in 2008, May 31st, 2008. I was doing syndicated radio, what, five, five radio affiliates in three states with the Jerry Miller Show. I was doing two TV shows with NBC29, writing for the Daily Progress, and had a website where I was aggregating all the content, very similar to I Love Seville. Very similar to what we're doing with I Love Siebel. Just what we're doing with I Love Siebel is better. <laughs> um, in 2008, we were in a recession. It was crappy times. I launched the business out of my condo. I was close to losing my condo. Because when I launched the business, I didn't have any customers for six months. I asked my buddy Shannon and my buddy Tom to move in with me, the condo. It was a three-bedroom at the Villas at Southern Ridge, Fifth Street Extended. If Tom and Shannon had not have moved in with me, and if, if I had not have offered, I'm like, look, dudes, you guys are both up for a lease renewal. You're paying $650 a month. Why don't I just call it $400 a month and you have no utilities, so you each do $400 a piece. You're going to save $250 on the rent alone and then you have no utilities, you're probably going to save $350, $400 a month. They were like, done, done. If those two dudes had not have said yes and moved in, I would have lost that property. I would have lost it. It was that $800 bucks helped make up the difference of what I was losing from a, a mortgage payment because I had no customers with the business I launched six months in. And the life savings I put in to capitalize the business was dwindling quickly. I mean, it was to the point, and many people have heard me say this on the show, I was going to the Panda Garden Buffet over there on Emmett Street by Lambeth Commons, and when the people weren't looking, I, was, I had Ziploc bags in my pocket, and I was scraping the food off the plate into Ziploc bags and eating that food for two or three days and feeding my dog that food because I could not afford dog food. But long story short, in 2008, in a recession, I launched the business, and finally it started clicking. And if you can launch a brand or a business or an idea, and if you can become empowered or if you can create a revenue stream that's tied to your passion and what you love to do, and if you can do it in a recession, then your business is going to explode as the economy turns. There's no better time to launch a brand or a business than in hard times like this because it forces you to bootstrap. It forces you to really make every penny count. 
and it allows you to get the infrastructure and foundation in place so as the economy turns, then you're just like, yeah, dog, it's coming in. And that's what happened to us. Now that condo's a rental property and it's offering me opportunity, and I don't want to spill too many details here, but potentially opportunity on a piece of property that has you know, very little debt to use as a commodity to, to maybe get something bigger. And that's how you build wealth. All right, I'm behind. Aaron, I apologize. I need to go to Aaron Lowry Tucker. I'm going to reach out to her now. Aaron, I'm excited to have you on the program today. Interesting how I met, um, well, actually, I've never, I have not met Aaron. Once she gets on the show, I'm going to tell you how this interview came uh, about. We got Aaron on the line. All right, fantastic. So, Aaron, I've, I have not met Aaron, but very intriguing, very interesting how this story played out. So, I'm in the giant on pantops in the produce aisle, masked up, um, got a hat on, got a mask on. And, 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 and I'm checking the oranges and the pineapples, and I'm squeezing the oranges and the pineapples, and I'm looking for the ones that aren't too ripe. And next thing I know, I, someone says, hey, are you Jerry? And I'm like, I'm Jerry, and I have a fantastic conversation with Aaron's daughter. Aaron's yes. daughter. <laughs> and long story short, this is how we are here now with Aaron. First, good afternoon, Aaron. You're live um, across all social media. I'm seeing five different states watching you here on our heat map. Um, how are you? How about an introduction to you first, Erin? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, my daughter has been telling me for a while that I needed to connect with you, and I just, I'm so busy all the time, so she did it for me, so. She has, um, your daughter has moxie. Yes, she does. Is that safe to say? She, I was like, I was so impressed. I'm like, this girl's got moxie and chutzpah. <laughs> She does. Yes. Thank you. Um, I'll take that as a compliment. That is a compliment. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. She's great. She's awesome. I love her. Um, so my name's Erin Tucker and I have, um, I'm a local. I, I've been, uh, I consider myself a local. I've been around since I was 13. So um, know all the ins and outs of Charlottesville and the surrounding. Uh, and I've worked at On Our Own here in Charlottesville for the last 12 years. On so, our own um, in Charlottesville, executive director. Um, yes, executive so director. How about this? For those that do not know on our own here in Charlottesville, give us an idea. The who, what, when, where, why. Great. Thank you. Um, so about 30 years ago, uh, a man named Paul Patrick, who was a consumer at Region 10, uh, saw a, um, basically he went to uh, see a speech done by Judy Chamberlain, who wrote a book called On Our Own. And it was about mental health patients, getting with other mental health patients, and uh, getting together and helping themselves. And so he is the first person who originated that here in Charlottesville. And uh, what it 30 years ago, we became, um, well, I, it was before me, of course, but um, Paul Patrick was able to start on our own. And it was then known as the Drop-In Center. And then about 12 years ago, we redesigned it to be a recovery center. So we are a recovery center. We provide free peer support for anyone in our community, outside of our community that needs help with mental health challenges or substance use challenges, anything like that. And they can come and get free support from us because everyone that works here has lived experience with some type of mental health challenge or substance use uh, challenge and can help, you know, help empower people who might need some extra help. So, so the thinking is um, we've walked the walk so we can talk the talk. And that's right. This topic is so freaking timely because I'm going to speak yeah. personally, Aaron, I am struggling with my mental health and COVID-19. I mean, I'm tired. I, I'm a human person. I, there's nothing I would rather do than talk with you in person. I'm tired of doing uh, conversations like this through video. There's certainly fatigue associated with this. I miss hanging out with my friends, my kids three. There's nothing I would rather do than see my kid play with other kids and run around a soccer field. And I worry about that with my kid and my development. I mean, I'm thinking about stuff that I've never thought I would ever think about before. Yeah, 
it, it, it's really, I'm seeing that across the board and, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And I, we're supporting all of our members every day, but we're growing because people like you are coming and saying, look, I'm, I'm really struggling. I need some support. And so the, the mental, you don't have to have any type of diagnosis or anything like that to attend any of our groups or our one-on-ones. You know, you just might be struggling with like what you said, you know, isolation and depression and like fatigue and it's, it's so, um, yeah, it's very, very challenging right now. How about you personally? I mean, are you hearing stuff like this? Are you feeling stuff like this? Oh, Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm so glad I'm connected. Uh, I, you know, I'm really connected to, to the, to our staff members, the, the folks that I've been working with for years. I have a therapist myself that I meet with every week and, um, you know, of course on zoom. Uh, so it's, you know, luckily, um, I'm still, you know, really attached to the people that I'm with. But I'm feeling the same way. I want to hug someone. Um, I had, I had, I have this like little story. If if I can tell you, yesterday, I took my dogs. My dogs are a little spoiled, but I took them to Dogtopia because I want them to get a little bit of social, um, you know, companionship. And uh, they got loose on 29, and I live in the country and. I'm running around trying to driving around trying to find my dogs who are running loose in the city and uh, one of the Dogtopia staff he was so sweet he started running helping me and finally we found them they ran to the SPCA in the woods so we're back in the woods trying to get the dogs and we finally get them and I just burst into tears and this sweet young kid looks at me and says I know it's COVID, but do you need a hug? And I said, yes. And he just hugged me and I just sobbed because, you know, it was so emotionally draining and I just needed that human contact. And I thought, how sweet, like this kid who's probably 18 or 19. And by the way, thank you everyone who helped me yesterday. Did you find your dogs? Um, we found the oh, dogs. Oh, thank goodness. We found the dogs. And, and it was after that that I started sobbing because it was just such a, a high, you know, stress It's situation. like all the emotions from COVID came out then. So it's like it wasn't <laughs> yeah. the emotions tied to your dog. It was COVID. That's right. That's right. It was. And, and to have this young person just look at me and say, can I give you a hug? It was just exactly what I needed. And... Was that safe? Probably not. Um, but it was the human interaction that I needed at the moment. And sometimes we have to do that for our own sanity. I mean, otherwise we're not going to get through this. I mean, amen. I, I, you know, when it, it happened to me, it's so fu- It's not funny that you brought this up. It's ironic that you brought this up because I experienced a similar situation as well. When I was watching, and, and I'm gonna, I got choked up yesterday on the program talking about this. I think I'm about to get choked up now, especially if you're getting <laughs> choked up over there. When I was watching, Sorry. when I was watching people, when I was watching these lunatics invade the Capitol, Dude, I found myself, and I'm, it's happening right now, I found myself on television when I was watching this, and I was like, tears were streaming down my face. And I kept looking at myself, and I'm like, what the, A, I was disgusted by the behavior, but then after I internalized and gained some perspective, I realized what was happening is, it was the emotion tied to that event, compounded with 10 months of every, all this other crap that was happening. And it was all coming right. out at the same time, Aaron. Yes. That's right. That's right. It's really, um, it's been so, it's been incredibly challenging. And, um, you know, I have to tell you, we lost someone. Uh, we lost one of our members on July 1st. He took his life. And uh, I really believe that if we had been able to be open and he had been able, he had been coming here for eight years. And if we had been able to have him come in, he was only 30 years old. So, you know, very, uh, very dealt with depression seriously and, um, and he wasn't able to come in. And so, uh, we lost him, uh, due to suicide and 
uh, his family has erected a gazebo for us in the back so that we can meet with people one-on-one, -on -one, a safe distance. Um, you know, it's the Luke J. Raymond F Foundation. They started it because of him. And um, it, it really, it hurts. And I don't want to lose anyone else. I just don't want to lose anyone else. So our staff call our members every day to check on them. Um, we got computers for people who don't have access to computers. We, uh, we bought, we purchased internet for people that don't have internet because I don't want that to be, you know, the difference between somebody being able to connect to us and not. Uh, so, so there's all sorts of, uh, things that we started doing. We do still see people twice a week, uh, to give them food. Uh, we have a, a food pantry. So twice a week, people come to the porch and we take their order and they get to sit and talk to us and see us face to face. And, and it's just, it's really a lovely way to still connect. But, you know, we're so used to hugging our members. We're used to, you know, to giving them that some of them don't get hugs from anyone but us. And so it has been extremely challenging the last 10 months. Um, so I, yeah, I really feel you on that. And, um, and other people are experiencing that we're supporting right now, 65 people every day. Wow. Yeah. I didn't realize it was that many. Yep. And when we're open, normally we have between 20 and 50 people come in throughout the day, but, uh, you know, we're growing because people are reaching out and we're able now to, to you know, reach out to people that we hadn't connected to before, people that wouldn't have come in through our doors. So there are some, I, I don't want to say any like bright, bright side to this, but there are some interesting things that have happened with reaching out by, um, you know, so socially on, on the computer. So Two part question for you, um, and you're amazing. Sure. She's amazing. Can you tell how passionate she is for her organization? I mean, you, it's, it's contagious. I mean, you're amazing. Thank um, you. This is a tough question. How do we, in like the scales of justice, how do we balance, um, you know, COVID safety with human connection and the need to interact with people. And if we don't, the ramification or the collateral damage of that is potentially more impactful than being exposed to COVID. Yeah. Um, uh, for, okay. I, so first I want to put a blanket statement out and say that this is just me talking sure. because I wouldn't want to put anyone else at har in harm's way, but I knew, so I have a 13 year old son and I also had to add to, to weigh, you know, his mental health, which started, I saw deteriorating during the summer with, um, you know, whether or not he was going to get together with his best friend and, and his best friend's mom and I talked and we decided it was not worth their mental health, keeping them apart. And so, um, you know, they've had play dates. They talk on the phone all the time, that sort of thing. Um, I think that you have to do what's right for you. If if your mental health is being is impaired, then I think that you really need to reach out and talk to other people who are dealing with the same thing, and maybe you can bubble together or something like that. Um, some of my friends out in Crozet, they actually have a a, a huge neighborhood bubble you know, where they're, they're all just like, Hey, we're just going to go ahead and, you know, be together because we can't keep our kids. We, we can't keep doing this, uh, to ourselves, to our family, to our kids. And it's scary. Like my 13 year old son is terrified that he's going to get it and kill his grandma. What? Like, that's what he's that is he keeps so saying, heavy. I, I know. He says, I don't want to kill. I don't want to kill my grandma because she's in her seventies and you know, she's got some underlying stuff and he's spent so much time with her. And so I've really had to talk to him about, 
I understand that. And I also know that you're not doing well right now. Like you have to get out. You have to do some stuff. You can't just stay, you know, in your bedroom. <laughs> so um, it's challenging. Yeah. It's really how did, how did he handle that? I mean, you're an amazing mom here. I mean, how did he handle that there? I mean, can you imagine a 13-year-old having to deal with a topic like that of like, do I hang out with my best friend? And if I hang out with my best friend, I risk potentially. I mean, that is so heavy. It's really heavy. And his school is actually going in person, but he won't. He, he just won't. He's doing it online. And, uh, and it's because of that fear. And I just have to sort of trust uh, trust his process. And also, um, I did get him a therapist, which he meets with every week on on, on the internet. Um, because I knew that it was really weighing on him. Uh, I have to trust him, but I also have to, like, say, wait a minute this is too far. Like you, like, I need you to, you know, come out with me or I need you to get out of here for a little while. Um, so it's hard. It's really hard. Well, I'll tell you what your um, I think your vulnerability that you're showcasing here is really, uh, impactful because the same stuff that you are going through and willing to talk about it, which takes courage is extremely similar to what my um, family's going through and so many are going through. So I think it helps for people to hear others experiencing what they're doing because it like almost destigmatizes it or detaboos it. If like we all right. know we're having this, then it becomes more acceptable to talk about. Um, how about closing on this? Anywhere you want to go on this topic? Um, we still got a lot of uncertainty in 2021. I think we were all hoping as New Year's came that we could just be to hell with 2020. Here comes 2021, it's gonna be awesome. But we yeah. still potentially have the darkest days in front of us, thanks to That's New Year's and Christmas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we're a platform of hope though. So I don't wanna yes. focus on the darkness, I wanna focus on the hope, realistic hope though. Um, anywhere you want to go on realistic hope for 2021 and some perspective you can share with the viewers. Uh, and, and I think just real quick before, and I know that we, we want to, I, I, I definitely want to stay hopeful, but I also want to say that, um, that I know that I have privilege that some people don't. And so I just want to put that out there that I know that there are people that are struggling that are black and brown, that are dealing with this and they don't have the luxury of deciding whether or not their children um, can stay home or not. So I just, at first I want to say that. And, and I think that's really important to say. Why, why are you um, getting, why are you getting emotional there? Um, I think because, uh, because of all the stuff that we've been seeing in the, you know, in the media and all the, the, the hate and the, the vileness and the racism, uh, it, it affects me really deeply. And um, On Our Own is really committed to anti-racism work. Uh, we're a member of the Mental Health and Wellness Coalition, and uh, the Arise Committee is part of that work. And so I just want to, I just wanted to say that because in speaking my own, you know, speaking about my own life, I also want to say that I know that there are people that don't have the choice, the choices that I have. So um, I just wanted to put that out there. Uh, and I also want to say that I'm really excited that, that we are starting to uh, get the, vac the vaccine. Um, frontline workers are already starting to get it. Uh, we're on the slate to get it within the next month or two. And then after that, they have three phases. And so I'm really, really hopeful by, by the summer that, that we'll all, that we'll all be able to like get out there and breathe freely and be able to hug each other again. So, um, so that's my hope. I'm really grateful to all the people that are making that possible, by the way, um, for the vaccines, uh, right now. So uh. I hope the same and Aaron, yeah. Aaron, Aaron, I, I hope you hear this every day. You are awesome. You're an oh, awesome hey, lady. How are you? Seriously, you are awesome. I, it was, a, it was a, an absolute breath of fresh air catching up with you today. 
Thank you so much, Jerry. It's so nice to meet you. And, and please, <laughs> please thank your daughter. She was 100% right about this interview. 100% right she was. You have a good one. Awesome. You take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Um, she's awesome. She's awesome. I love uh, folks that are willing to be like vulnerable and real. It takes a lot of courage to do that. That was a great interview. Um, all right, that's all she wrote. It's Friday. Uh, you got a Boston College UVA matchup Saturday at 2 o'clock. UVA, Boston College, Saturday at 2 o'clock. Let's watch that. Um, thank you for joining us on the show. We just try to showcase the best of Charlottesville, Virginia. The whole point of the show is to showcase the best of Charlottesville. We will see you on Monday at 1015 right here on the I Love Seville Network with Kelly Jackson and Jamie Schwartz, the stars of Women Changing Our World. And folks, next Thursday at 10.15 a.m., we debut um, a brand new show on this network um, with Alex Erpe and his family, the team behind Emergent Financial Services. And this brand new show that airs Thursdays at 10.15 a.m. on the I Love Seville Network is called Today, E manana, today and tomorrow. And the premise of the program is to show a positive spotlight on the Hispanic community in Charlottesville and Central Virginia. That's the entire premise. I'm excited for it. You guys have a good one. Take care.